Today we will be talking about the storage mechanisms of carbohydrates, okay? So specifically carbohydrate metabolism. But before we begin that, I just want to mention that I, I said in the last video that uh, blood type A can accept blood type AB. Uh, that's an error. I didn't mean to say that. I meant to say that blood type AB can accept blood type A uh, because they have almost the same glycoproteins. It's not the other way around. Anyways, back to the lecture. Okay, so one of the main questions that students have is that they ask, you know, why is uh, glycogen used for energy storage? Why don't we just use starches like plants do? Well, there's an issue that we run into if we use starches um, for animal cells, right? So, first of all, glycogen, it's, it's very efficient in storing energy, right? We don't store a lot of energy in the form of fat. Fat is just like long-term use, right? Um, but sugars, sugars are stored in glycogen because you can rip off sugars very easily. You can use them for reactions. So uh, we don't use fats, so we use um, uh, not fats, right? So we don't use fats because it takes longer to oxidize. Right? And then even if you do need to oxidize it, well, you need oxygen, right? And so if we rely on fat for quick energy, well, you're going to need oxygen to, to oxidize a fat. So if you want to use fat, it needs oxygen. And I just covered in the carbohydrate videos that you can actually create ATP, which is energy for the body, without using oxygen, right? So when we do glycolysis, we're breaking down this glycogen molecule without oxygen, right? But if you want to uh, use fats for energy, you're always going to need oxygen, okay? And uh, even if you want to use fats, you can't use fats to regulate blood sugar. So can't can't regulate blood sugar. Okay. So that's the main reason why we don't use um, fat as a quick energy storage. And, again, and of course, you don't use starches uh, for energy either because they don't have as much glucose in them, okay? So glycogen has a lot of glucose in it. It can be easily oxidized without um, having too much energy put into it. You can even make energy without using oxygen. And then you can regulate your blood sugar using glycogen. You can't get that from fats. So fats is more of a long-term energy storage uh, because it requires more energy to oxidize. So when do we use glycogen? When do we use that? Well, we only use glycogen whenever our ATP levels are low or when our glucose levels are low. So low, say low glucose, or ATP. Uh, means we need to use glycogen. And so the process of breaking down glycogen to get glucose, which will then be used to create ATP, we'll, we call that uh, gl well, glycogen, sorry. So we have glycogenolysis. Uh, and um, that's essentially the breakdown of a glycogen molecule for sugars, okay? That's, that's all it is. So this process is called glyconol um, glycogenolysis. Now, it's not as simple a uh, hydrolysis reaction as it is in starches, okay? So in plants, uh, they just get their sugars, they just use water to cut down the um, molecules, and they release sugars that way. But in animal cells, such as chihuahuas or... Um, uh, pigs, well, they don't use water to cut down these uh, sugars. They actually use phosphates, okay? So this is a different reaction. Um, so, of course, we're going to have this. We're going to have this reaction. It is going to be called phosphorolysis. So it's going to be phos 
for all lysis. And essentially, lysis means to cut, phospho means to add a phosphate group or phosphate. And where does it add it? Well, over here on this cute little picture, uh, here is a non-reducing end. So remember, a non-reducing end means that it's a uh, sugar that does not connect to other sugars. Okay, it's just the very end of it. So in this glycogen molecule, we have a non-reducing end. If we zoom in on this chain right here, and you'll this this is a chain right here, right? Okay. So this uh, sugar in green is going to be the non-reducing sugar. And what happens here is that a phosphate group actually attaches itself into this bond right here. So it breaks this glycosidic bond, okay? And this is, of course, an alpha bond. It breaks that bond, and now we have a free sugar. This is a little bit different, isn't it? Doesn't it remind you of glycolysis? So you're probably saying, hey, wait, hold on. I don't understand. What's the difference between glycogenolysis and glycolysis? You know, we have the sugar, I don't understand. Well, the difference is that in glycolysis, you had a donut and you're eating that donut. It was very good. You have glucose in your body. It's going to enter a cell and then it's going to create ATP. Here, you didn't start with a free glucose. No, you had to get your glucose from within your body. This glucose did not come from an external source. So you have to get that glucose uh, from the glycogen. So glycogenolysis is just a process of breaking down glycogen in order to get that sugar, to get that glucose, you know? So here, this is what we're after, right? We have phosphorolysis, we broke down a uh, sugar, a glucose molecule, and now we have a glucose attached to a phosphate group. So this looks very similar to step one, where we had a glu uh, glucose molecule, and we uh, use hexokinase to add a phosphate group. So yes, we still have a glucose with a phosphate group. Very cool. So one of the benefits that we see from using glycogen as a storage molecule is that we have a lot of non-reducing ends. And notice that um, phosphorylase, which is the enzyme that does phosphor um, phosphorylysis for the glycogen molecule, it can take off a lot of sugars. So let's estimate that there's about 19 reducing ends, um, non-reducing ends, excuse me. That means that phosphorylase can get 19 sugars right here. So because we have a lot of non-reducing ends in glycol and uh, glycogen, we have a lot of potential sugars to do uh, reactions, okay? And of course, this only breaks, this only breaks um, the 1-4 bonds. So these are usually alpha, uh, let's see, 1-4. So we have 1-4 bonds, okay, and sugars. But now let's kind of focus our attention on the glucose 1-phosphate. So I know that you're thinking, well, first of all, why do we even make glucose 1-phosphate? Shouldn't we be making glucose 6-phosphate, G6P? Well, yeah, we should, but at the same time, we use less ATP when we make glucose 1-phosphate. So the difference between uh, glycogenolysis and glycolysis, so let's just write right here, uh, let's put glyco. Well, glycogenolysis, you know, starts with uh, G1P, which is glucose 1-phosphate, and then it's going to convert, and it does this by uh, isomerization. And you know that isomerization is essentially uh, playing Legos, right? So we're going to use an enzyme that just moves around hydrogens, carbons, oxygens, whatever. It just moves them around to different parts of the, uh, the molecule to create a different molecule. So it's going to uh, mess with the molecular structure to create G6P and then that can enter glycolysis but we do this because it uses less ATP so it just uses uses less ATP okay and what else well did we need an enzyme uh, to do this well yeah but we didn't need hexokinase okay so we technically use less ATP, okay? Uh, does not need, does not need 
um, hexokinase. And does this make sense? Does it make sense to use less ATP when you need energy? Yeah. You know, glycogen is your first reserves, uh, reserves uh, for quick energy storage. You know, so sugars are needed to do exercise, right? And so glycogen is going to be the first guy that your body goes to in order to get sugars. If you need energy, are you going to use something that requires a lot of energy to get from? No. Glycogen only needs a little bit of ATP. So that's why we use glycogenolysis, okay, because it uses less ATP to make G1P, which is in uh, going to isomerize into G6P. Now, both glycogen phosphorylase and glycogen synthase are regulated by hormones. So let me write that down. Glycogen, so glycogen, this is a great color, my gosh, glycogen uh, phosphorylase. like a bubblegum pink. It's pretty pretty good. Glycogen phosphorylase and uh, synthase, right? So of course, when I say synthase, I mean glycogen synthase. I just don't want to write it out again. I'm pretty lazy. So both of these guys right here, they're regulated. They're regulated by hormones. Ooh. And so one of the um, most important, or all of them are important, but one of the most um, popular to study hormones would be insulin, okay? So uh, whenever people uh, have diabetes, specifically diabetes mellitus, uh, when they eat a snack, they have to uh, prick their fingers with a needle and test of blood a couple of hours later in order to see... Um, it, where their glu uh, their glucose levels are at, right? Because they don't produce enough insulin. They don't have enough hormones to convert the uh, glucose in their bodies, right? So they have to take insulin shots. And so what is uh, diabetes? What, it, what does insulin do? Well, you may know that insulin occurs after you eat something, right? But why? Well, it all happens because of the blood sugar in your blood, right? <laughs> Obviously, but it's the blood sugar levels, right? So insulin, so insulin is uh, secreted by the beta uh, cells, right, in the pancreas. So if you're studying for the MCAT, uh, this is the demographic that my videos go out for, right? Um, so if you're studying for the MCAT, the pancreas actually excretes uh, beta cells, and those beta cells trigger the release of insulin, which is a hormone. Okay, so what does insulin do? Well, insulin, uh, it sees that there's too much glucose in your blood, right? So you just ate a donut, and it sees that there's a lot of glucose. So it says, all right, we're going to convert this free glucose into glycogen. Okay, so it converts, converts glucose into glycogen, into uh, glycogen, right? So um, what is this, right? Did we create something or did we destroy something? Well, we created a molecule, right? So we created uh, glycogen from glucose. So this is called an anabolic, an anabolic hormone. Okay, so there you go. So insulin actually increases the uptake of glucose in the muscle, right? So it's going to store glucose into the muscle. Uh, of course, the glucose is in the form of glycogen. So you know that liver is 90%, um, excuse me, that the liver holds 90% of the glycogen in the body, and then the 10% of glycogen is like in the muscles, right? So there it's pretty cool I guess um, so yeah I mean it also increases the rate of glucose transport into the muscle so it uh, stores stores glycogen in muscle and kind of speeds up the process of storing it okay so that's why we're going to be using uh, insulin to kind of counteract the amount of glucose in the blood Okay, so what is diabetes? Diabetes just means that your body 
uh, it's not very uh, sensitive to insulin. Okay, so you need a lot more insulin than usual to get the same amount of uh, effects, um, right? So your body, it releases insulin, right? But it's not enough. And so you need more insulin to convert the glucose into uh, glycogen. And so whenever you're fasting or you haven't eaten for a day, right? Uh, the insulin levels go down, right? Uh, the glucose transport goes down as well and then glycogen synthesis goes down as well right so this is what you see right here okay so after you eat a meal the uh, energy storages is, is about 50% carbohydrates 30% uh, 33% uh, fatty acids and then 17% amino acids you can just consider this to be fat okay but then let's say that you forgot to eat something right so immediately your body stops using um, glucose as an energy source and it shifts to fatty acids, okay, because that's again a long term energy storage, right? It requires more energy to break down oxygen to create energy, which is weird, but your body shifts to uh, fatty acids because there's more energy per gram of fat, okay? And then if you're fasting for 40 days, let's say uh, you're fasting for a month for Ramadan, let's, let's make that example, your body is going to be. Um, kind of catabolizing fats more, okay? So of course your insulin goes down, your glycogen sources go down drastically, and the uh, glucose transport goes down as well. Whenever you're fed, the insulin goes up, uh, glycogen production goes up as well, and um, what else? And the transportation of glucose throughout the body goes up as well. So now we will be talking about uh, gluconeogenesis. So what is gluconeogenesis and why do we do it? Gluconeogenesis. This is like some macaroni and cheese color right here. It's pretty good colors this video. I'm very happy about that. So essentially gluconeogenesis is the recreation of glucose from molecules that are not glucose. Very weird but it's possible. So you remember in the last slide, I said, hey, you know, sometimes when you're fasting, either for uh, personal reasons or health reasons, etc., your body starts using fats more. Okay, big whoop. Why should I care? Well, I, uh, in, a, in a previous video, I said, hey, your body produces sugars by itself because sugars are so important that your body doesn't want to risk not having sugars, okay? So because sugars are so important, our bodies are capable of creating sugars by themselves, we can create glucose, and that is this process. So gluconeogenesis is just a creation of sugars or glucose from you know fatty acids, amino acids, right, etc. So it is the creation, creation of let's say glucose of glucose, specifically sugars, if you want to be general, creation of glucose from non from non-sugar uh, molecules. And we do this because there are really two organs in our body that need sugar. So one of the organs, well, I guess the other one's not really an organ, but it's a body part. So one part of the body that needs constant energy is the brain. So brain and then the other part of the body is the muscle, right? So the muscles in the body need constant energy. Brain and muscles need constant energy. Okay, and we also do gluconeogenesis uh, to prevent hypoglycemia. You know, prevents, prevents hypoglycemia. So hypoglycemia, hypo just means under, glycemia just means relating to the blood, okay? So um, this is the low blood levels, uh, excuse me, low blood sugar levels in the, in the blood, obviously. So these are uh, found in people, typically who uh, they need snacks when they go on trips, right? Because they don't want their blood sugars to go low or they'll faint, right? So um, using gluc gluconeogenesis prevents hypo hypoglycemia. Okay, so 
of course your brain can use fats as energy but that's only when you've been starving for so long or when you've been uh, fasting for so long so where in the body is uh, gluconeogenesis occurring for the most part uh, well it's really occurring um, from the liver and from the kidneys so 90 percent of the sugars formed from gluconeogenesis come from the liver and then only 10 percent only 10 percent of the sugars produced from gluconeogenesis come from the kidneys right why is that well whenever you're producing uh, pyruvate and lactate uh, those molecules go into the liver and they perform gluconeogenesis and they're going to make sugars again so what can we use what can we use uh, to do gluconeogenesis well we can use lactate and pyruvate this is like the main uh, players for gluconeogenesis so these are like super important Uh, we can use amino acids, uh, specifically alanine. Alanine is really popular uh, to do gluconeogenesis with. It's very simple to work with. And of course we can use glycerol. So this is just fats, okay? Right? So your body has a lot of ways to create sugars from these um, molecules and really if you want it to be really dramatic uh, you can say that anything in the body that can be converted into pyruvate or oxo sorry oxaloacetate can be used to do gluconeogenesis so pyruvate pyruvate and you know you have to get like a degree in calculus or something to pronounce this word so oxa low acetate okay it's a very weird word okay but essentially if anything in the body if, if something can convert itself into pyruvate or oxaloacetate ooh, it will be used to create uh, glucose from gluconeogenesis okay so you can say uses uses pyruvate and and let's just call that OXA, okay? So now we will begin our descent into gluconeogenesis. It's actually a shorter step, uh, I guess a shorter reaction uh, compared to glycolysis. So let's begin, okay? So first of all, this first step occurs in the mitochondria. So this is uh, occurring, occurs in the mitochondria. And what happens here is that pyruvate enters the mitochondria, right? And then it interacts with acetylcoenzyme A. So acetylcoenzyme A, let's call it acetylcoenzyme A, right? So let's let's step back for a minute. Acetylcoenzyme A only occurs when there's a lot of oxidation because of fats. Okay, so whenever the body has a lot of energy, it's going to be oxidizing fats, okay? And then acetylcoenzyme A is produced. So what does that mean? It means this only shows up when we have a lot of energy. Only occurs, only, um, let's say only occurs when we have energy. And so the body says, hey, you know what? I don't need any more pyruvate uh, because acetylcholine A is telling me that I have a lot of energy. Um, therefore, I need to convert this pyruvate A back into glucose. And then from glucose, I could just put it back into glycogen, just store it for later, okay? So I'm sorry that you went through gly glycolysis for nothing, but I don't need you right now. So he's essentially getting a pink slip. <laughs> Get it, because pink writing and whatever so he's uh he's getting laid off and he's going to be called back later so pyruvate enters the mitochondria it interacts with acetylcholine a and says okay we well, don't need you right now you have to convert 
uh, into glucose. So now this kind of triggers the reaction for gluconeogenesis, or yes, gluconeogenesis. So this is kind of like the trigger right here. And what happens here is that inside the blood, or I guess inside the uh, fluid of the body, there is uh, carbon dioxide and there's water. Now whenever carbon dioxide and water interact with each other, they form bicarbonate, okay? So they form bicarbonate. Now, an enzyme comes in and it's called pyruvate carboxylase. Now car pyruvate carboxylase, let's just call that carboxylase, it's basically going to get this bicarbonate atom or uh, molecule and it's going to put it over here, right? So this enzyme is going to put it over here and this is a transfer reaction. Of course, this uses ATP, okay? So now we have ADP and we have a phosphate group just laying around. That's gonna be very important later on. So the second step is going to be called phosphoenolpyruvate carboxokinase. Okay, so it's just this guy right here and it's occurring inside the cytosol. So this is the cytosol, cytosol, okay? All right, so what happens here? What happens here is that ox well, oxaloacetate is going to be reduced into malate, okay? Uh, so oxaloacetate reduces to malate inside the mitochondria, and then the malate escapes from the mitochondria, and then is going to be uh, reduced into oxaloacetate. So that seems kind of, kind of weird, right? But not really. Why does this occur? Well, oxaloacetate reduces to malate because oxaloacetate is too large and too polar to escape the mitochondrial membrane, okay? So it's going to become uh, oxidized, um, uh, excuse me, it's going to reduce into malate, okay? So this is a reduction right here. So this is reduction. Let me rewrite that. So reduced over here. And now when it's malate, it's going to come out the mitochondria and it's going to oxidize into oxaloacetate. Right. So how does that occur? Well, over here, we're going to take oxaloacetate and we're going to react it with the phosphoenolpyruvate carboxylokinase. I guess you could call it PEP, PEP, right? And then we're going to combine it with something that is called uh, guanosine triphosphate. So don't worry about what this looks like. Just know that it's going to react with GTP and then what's gonna happen? Well, what's gonna happen is that it's going to kind of phosphorylate this oxygen right here, right? Because that's what kinases do, they phosphorylate, right? So it just grabs the phosphate group from the GTP. So again, uh, carboxokinase grabs a phosphate group from the GTP and attaches it to this oxygen, okay? So uh, phosphorylates Um, oxaloacetate. Okay. Now, this is where gluconeogenesis gets a little bit weird. Uh, so we made PEP, right? So we made PEP. But PEP is going to go into the reverse direction of glycolysis. So if you look at your notes for glycolysis, you'll notice that PEP will do the reverse of what's occurring. Okay, so it's gonna go through two steps in the reverse direction of glycolysis to give you 3-phosphoglycerate. And then 3-phosphoglycerate is going to go in the reverse direction uh, to give you triose phosphate. And then that triose phosphate is just gonna do an aldase, uh, aldolase uh, reaction. Okay, so that's the same thing as uh, was happening in glycolysis, okay? But if you just want to ignore it, you can just consider uh, PEP um, to be uh, occurring before fructose 1,6-biphosphate, okay? So again, to recap, uh, I'm not going to show the steps because they're exactly the same steps as glycolysis, but in reverse, okay? So what happens here is that PEP um, 
it actually, how should I say, it converts itself into fructose 1,6-biphosphate. Of course, you have different reactions between that conversion, but I'm not going to show it here, okay, because we have time constraints, right? So now we have fructose 1,6-biphosphate, okay? Now, ultimately, I want to make glucose, right? I want to make glucose. So what do I have to do to fructose 1,6-biphosphate in order to get glucose, or at least closer to it? Well, I actually have to do something weird, right? I have to um, use hydrolysis, right? So I have to use this water to cut some bonds. What am I going to cut? Well, I'm going to cut this phosphate group, okay? So did I use any enzymes? Um, yeah, I did. I used fructose 1,6-biphosphatase, okay? So all you need to know is that we're going to use an enzyme, and this enzyme is just going to do hydrolysis. That's all that's doing. Fructose 1,6-biphosphatase, very simple to remember. It's literally the name, except what an ace right there. So all it does is that it uses water to cut down this phosphate group, okay? So now notice that we took out this phosphate group and we released a phosphate uh, ion right there. Okay, so essentially it reverses phosphofructokinase. Okay, so this reverses, reverses phosphofructokinase. That's all that happens, okay? And this is metabolically irreversible, right? And we say that because the delta G is really, really negative. And if it's really negative, we want this to happen. We don't want this to be reversible, okay? So this is metabolically irreversible. Okay, so there you go. That's, that's all there is. And then there's one more step. So now the final step right here is when the uh, G6P, right, so glucose 6-phosphate is going to be um, transported from the cytosol into the endoplasmic reticulum. Okay, so G6P is transported to cytosol using a uh, transporter, okay? So it uses the GLUT7 transporter. So you can kind of think of it as like a protein that's acting as a taxi. So the G6P, uh, it needs a transporter. It uses the GLUT7 transporter um, to transport itself from the cytosol into the endoplasmic reticulum. Endoplasmic reticulum, okay? So where is the endoplasmic reticulum? Well, you can find that on the uh, membrane, okay, of the liver, kidney, uh, pancreas, and small intestines, okay? So we can think of it as the liver, uh, kidney, kidney, um, and let's just say, uh, small intestine okay so what happens well what happens here is that you have this phosphate right so we have glucose 6 phosphate now it's very similar to step 1 of uh, glycolysis so remember in step 1 in glycolysis you had your glucose and you added a phosphate group to the sixth carbon via hexokinase well, all you need to do is a uh, simple hydrolysis reaction, okay? So again, we're going to be using water to cut this bond, right? So we're going to be dephosphorylating this phosphate group, okay? So we're going to be using glucose 6-phosphatase, right? That's all we're doing. We have an enzyme. It's going to use water to cut down this phosphate group. And whenever you cut down that phosphate group, you have glucose. So you can see that this is the reverse of hexokinase. So this is the reverse, reverses hexokinase. Right, let's, let's do that better. There we go. 
Okay, so again, this is a metabolically irreversible reaction, okay, because the delta G for this reaction is going to be around negative 14 uh, kilojoules per mole, right? So this is a metabolically irreversible reaction. Now, what happens to the glucose? Well, the glucose can exit the uh, membrane and it can be released uh, from the endoplasmic reticulum into the bloodstream. So can escape, let's see, can, can escape the ER and enter bloodstream. And that's all there is to it. Now let's talk about the regulation of gluconeogenesis. Well, in these two reactions, we have glycolysis on the left-hand side, and we have gluconeogenesis on the right-hand side. Now, what dictates uh, which reaction is gonna take place, right? So in the body, you have two options. You either do glycolysis or you, or you do uh, gluconeogenesis. So what dictates that? Well, we have, in this step, we have these two enzymes, right? So we have phosphofructokinase, so we, we will call this PFK. And then we have fructose 1,6-biphosphate. And we're just going to call that F1,6B, uh, right? Okay, so if you have a lot of fructose uh, kinase, right? So if we have a lot of phosphofructokinase, then it will drive the reaction into a glycosidic right, so uh, into glycolysis, excuse me. So more PFK means glyco, uh, glycolysis, okay, so more, more PFK is equal to glycolysis. And you should know that if you have more PFK, the amount of fructose 1,6-biphosphatase is going to go down, okay, so these are inversely related, right, if you like mathematical terms. It means if one is a high amount, the other one is going to be a low amount, okay? It's kind of like glucose and insulin. If you have a lot of insulin in your body, you're not going to have a lot of glucose, right? If you have a lot of glucose in your body, you're going to have a low amount of insulin. So it's inversely related. And you can say that more uh, F16, uh, 16 biphosphatase is equal to gluconeogenesis. Okay, so they're kind of inversely related. What else affects the uh, rate of metabolism? Well, you know, if you have a lot of ATP, and um, you're you're gonna have a little bit of AMP. So, what does that mean? Let's let's write this down. So, if if more ATP is present, let's say present, then we have a little bit of AMP. And this makes sense, right? If you have a lot of ATP, that means triphosphate, then we're going to have a little bit of AMP, which means monophosphate. So this one has three phosphate groups, and this one only has one phosphate group. The ATP can go to uh, two reactions uh, to make the AMP, okay? So it's kind of like um, your uh, reactants, and then this is going to be your product, right? So if you have more reactants than products, well, we don't need to make more reactants, right? We don't need to make more ATP. So what I'm saying is, if you have ATP, then we don't need to uh, convert any more glucose into pyruvate, right? So we don't need to do glycolysis because remember, ATP is only for the, um, excuse me, glycolysis is only for the generation of ATP. That's only when you don't have enough ATP. But if you have enough ATP, why do we need to do glycolysis? No, you're making too many pyruvates. We're gonna need to do gluconeogenesis. So if more ATP is present, then you're going to do gluconeogenesis to convert either the lactic acid or the pyruvate into glucose, right? Because it's more efficient to store glucose as 
uh, glycogen. So after we make glucose, it's going to do some more reactions and it's going to go back to uh, the glycogen molecule. Okay, so more ATP. ATP is going to favor gluconeogenesis. And then we have more AMP. That's just kind of like the byproduct. It's when um, you use all your ATPs, eventually you get monophosphate. So that means that we're in an environment that doesn't have a lot of energy. So if we don't have enough energy, does it make sense for me to keep making glucose um, and store it into the glycogen molecule? No, it doesn't make sense for me to just store it. I need to go into my reserves and break the, gly uh, the glycogen, release the glucose, and then convert the glucose into pyruvate and generate ATP. So if I have a lot of monophosphate, I'm going to need to do glycolysis, right? So this favors glycolysis. So to recap, gluconeogenesis converts pyruvate back into glucose and stores it for later, but glycolysis takes that glucose and converts it to pyruvate or lactic acid. So we can also say that phosphofructokinase is inhibited, inhibited by ATP. If there's too much energy in the system, do we need to create pyruvate? No. So phosphofructokinase, which dictates if we're going to do glycolysis, is not going to occur. You know, it's not going to uh, go forward in the reaction because there's already too many uh, ATP molecules. There's a lot of energy already, so we don't need to make energy. Likewise, fructose 1,6-biphosphate is going to be inhibited, inhibited right here, by AMP. So that means, well, we don't have enough energy. So would it make sense to store the glucose, or excuse me, to store pyruvate as glucose? No, it doesn't make sense. I don't want to store glucose. I want to use my glucose to create energy. So again, PFK is going to be inhibited by ATP, and then fructose 1,6-biphosphatase is going to be inhibited by AMP. Let's talk about the interactions between glycolysis and gluconeogenesis. There is a very um, well-studied cycle, and it is called the Cori cycle. It's called Cori cycle, right? And essentially, it's active whenever you're exercising. Let's say that you're exercising um, for a competition, and your body is, you know, working out. So whenever your muscles are, are exercising, per se, they're converting glucose into lactic acid, right? So that's the uh, burning sensation that you feel whenever you're doing, um, you know, squats or bicep curls or something. But remember that whenever glucose is being converted into lactate, it's going to be uh, producing, it's going to produce lots of NADH. So it makes lots of NADH. Now, you need oxygen, right, to um, convert this NADH into NAD+, right? So we need to do what? We need to oxidize this, um, this molecule. But of course, this is an anaerobic um, process. So this is an anaerobic process. So what do we do? Uh, we need to convert this, right? If we if we just have lactic acid building up in the muscle, that's really bad. It's going to lower the pH of the blood because, of course, it's acid, right? So it's it's uh, slightly acidic. It's going to lower the blood. And what happens? Well, you're going to get um, uh, acidosis, and you're going to faint, right? So uh, that's why you never see people exercising when they're holding their breaths, right? You don't see that. If you did that, you would actually pass out because your blood would become uh, acidic and you would actually uh, have acidosis. So what are we to do? How do we convert uh, lactate into a better product? Well, the lactate is going to exit the muscle and enter the bloodstream. The bloodstream is going to enter the liver. Here, the lactate is going to convert into pyruvate and then glucose. 
So we created glucose from a molecule that was not a sugar. So what is this called? This is called gluconeogenesis. Now the glucose is going to go into the, the bloodstream and back into the muscle because the muscle is still exercising. We need glucose to create uh, ATP via glycolysis. So of course in the muscle the glucose will convert itself into pyruvate and then lactic acid. So that is glycolysis. So you're probably saying, well, you know, how are we going to, you know, address the issue of needing oxygen? Doesn't this cycle need oxygen? Because you have a buildup of NADH, and if you have too much NADH, it's not good for the system. How do we solve that? Well, the muscle is converting pyruvate into lactate, right? So look at this chart over here. Here's pyruvate, and it's going to utilize an, an, an enzyme called lactate dehydrogenase, sorry, dehydrogenase, right? So what happens here is that the NADH is going to be oxidized, right? Is going to be oxidized into NAD whenever pyruvate is reduced into lactate. So we can say that NADH, NADH goes to NAD. So we're gonna call this what? We lost a hydrogen, therefore this is oxidation. Oxidized. And pyruvate went to lactate, right? So we're going to say pyruvate went to lactate. If something was oxidized, then we could say the other thing was reduced. And that makes sense because carbon lost a bond to oxygen and it gained a hydrogen, so it's reduced, right? So because pyruvate was reduced into lactate via lactate dehydrogenase, the NADH is going to be oxidized by the enzyme. And so that kind of, um, essentially it allows us to continue the cycle without needing oxygen because normally oxygen would just bind to NADH and convert it to NAD, okay? But we don't have oxygen here. This is an anaerobic uh, process. So we can just convert pyruvate into lactate and use lactate dehydrogenase to um, oxidize NADH. Okay, so that's essentially the quarry cycle. Your muscles need um, glucose, so the glucose is produced by the liver. The glucose enters the muscle, converts itself to lactic acid via glycolysis. You have a lot of a lot of ac uh, sorry, you have a lot of lactic acid buildup, which is bad. So the lactate goes into the liver, converts itself into glucose, and goes back into the muscle. So it's a cycle, and it occurs uh, during exercising. We will now talk about everybody's um, favorite subject, right? We're, we're going to be talking about alcohol. So what happens whenever you're at a bar and you're drinking, you know, three bottles of vodka? You know, some people say, well, you know, you shouldn't drink alcohol. It's bad for your liver. Why is that? It's true that alcohol is bad for your liver, but why? Let's, let's get into the biochemistry aspect of it, right? So let's say you're drinking some alcohol. Whenever you drink it, the NAD plus is going to be reduced, right? It's going to be reduced into NADH. And it's going to form acetaldehyde. Now that acetaldehyde is going to be converted into acetate. But notice that in both processes, uh, the conversion of ethanol to acetaldehyde and the conversion of acetaldehyde into acetate, we reduce uh, NAD into NADH, right? So we have a buildup, we're, we're having a buildup of NADH. So we can say that consuming ethanol or alcohol increases the NADH in the liver. So uh, consuming, consuming alcohol, let's just say, yeah, let's, let's call that alcohol, alk, increases NADH. Okay, so I don't care. Why should I care? Well, you should care because whenever you're increasing NADH, you're decreasing the amount of NAD+. Why does that matter? Well, some reactions, for instance, the conversion of pyruvate into lactate, right? They're going to need 
to have NAD, uh, sorry, NAD plus. If we don't have NAD plus, well, we're, get, we're not gonna create any uh, glucose, right, for the muscles. And that kind of leads into a buildup of lactic acid, right? So if you have this buildup of lactic acid, well, you're gonna have some acidosis, right? And then if you have a buildup of lactic acid, you're not gonna have uh, any production of glucose. So what does that lead to you? It leads to hypoglycemia, okay? So consuming too much alcohol leads to uh, hypoglycemia in undernourished people. So people who are not eating a healthy diet, you know, they don't have uh, enough vegetables or calories in their diet, they're undernourished. And so when they drink a lot of alcohol, they're gonna be converting too many um, NAD into NADH. And if you have too many NADH, that could lead to hypoglycemia, which is just low blood sugar. So uh, could lead, could lead to um, hypoglycemia. And what else? And a buildup of lactic acid, and that means acidosis. But the acidosis is not noticeable, right? It's not noticeable from the outside. It's occurring in the inside, but it's not obvious that it's happening, right? So what else uh, inhibits this reaction? Um, so whenever you have um, too much NADH, you don't have enough NAD, right? I'm repeating it, so it must be important. Why is that important? Well, it limits, um, it limits gluconeogenesis, which means it limits the production of glucose, and it limits fatty acid metabolism. What is that? Fatty acid metabolism is essentially your body breaking down fats in the body to convert them into energy. But since the liver cannot do that, because we don't have enough NAD to do that, you're going to have a buildup of fats on the liver, okay? And your liver is going to get weird and is going to say, well, you know, I have all this fat. Clearly, I have to produce more fat because that's what I'm doing already. So now your liver is producing fatty acids. Why is that bad? Well, if you have too much fatty acid on the liver, it's going to kind of block the uh, blood. Uh, it's going to block the capillaries. It's going to block the veins. And you can't have as much blood flowing out. Okay, so now you're getting into like a dangerous territory. So this is really common within alcoholics or people who abuse alcohol. Uh, I like to think of Ernest Hemingway. Ernest Hemingway used to drink like six bottles of, of whiskey a day, and he would just do that. And so you can tell that his liver was suffering greatly. He had too much NAD+, and his body was producing too many fatty acids in his liver. And so here we have uh, cirrhosis of the liver. So this is cirrhosis right here. So cirrhosis, let me spell that correctly. So cirrhosis of the liver. So because of excessive alcohol consumption, uh, the liver is producing a lot of fats and that fats creates scarring tissue, which is irreversible. If this gets too uh, bad, you're gonna have to take out the liver and replace it. So of course you have to do everything in moderation. Okay, so this is you know, excessive alcohol consumption. You're probably wondering, well, Brian, how come we have hangovers? Well, we have hangovers because acetaldehyde is very reactive. Sometimes it can escape the liver into the bloodstream and react with uh, different groups. For instance, proteins, uh, nucleotides, NH2 groups, and they can form very toxic substances in the body. Now, if those toxic substances reach a level, uh, I don't know the level specifically, but if it reaches that level, the body has an uh, adverse reaction to it. So that is why you get a hangover. It is just the toxic substance buildup by acetaldehyde. So this one right here causes hangovers. Right, so whenever you feel uh, like you're gonna throw up and your head is hurting, it's because acetaldehyde is producing products that shouldn't be produced in the first place. And you're probably wondering, why can't I take medication with alcohol? 
what's up with that? You know, I want to take Tylenol. Never take Tylenol with alcohol. Never. Because ethanol is going to oxidize uh, Tylenol, which is just acetyl, uh, I believe it was acetaminophen. Yes, if I remember correctly, it's acetaminophen. So ethanol is going to oxidize acetaminophen, which is just the pharmaceutical name for Tylenol, and it's going to produce a product. But that product is toxic to the body, and it's going to affect the liver, and it's going to damage the liver. So that is why you do not take medication with alcohol. We will now briefly go over the... Um, metabolism of certain fuel types during exercise. So in panel A, we have some weird looking lines, right? But notice that this orange line and this purple line, they don't really last for too long. They're like 30 seconds long, okay? And essentially, it's whenever uh, you're doing something quick, like a reflex or, um, you know, a quick run. Your body is going to be using your ATP storages very readily. Right? It's also going to be using uh, phosphocreatine. So it's not efficient because it only supplies your body with energy for like 10 seconds. Okay, After that, um, your body is going to depend on uh, glycolysis. Okay, So let's say that you're exercising, you're lifting weights. Your body is going to switch into the anaerobic metabolism. So it's a green one. Okay, And it's going to be breaking down uh, glucose to form pyruvate and lactic acid. Okay, so there's no oxygen right here. This is anaerobic. And there are two problems with that. Because uh, one of the problems is that lactic acid is building up. And when that happens, um, you're going to have a lower pH in your blood, which is bad. Also, the amount of glucose in your body is limited, right? So we have limited uh, supplies of glucose and glyc uh, glycogen. So, of course, those are going to run out. So when that happens, after like three minutes of exercising, your body switches to the anaerobic metabolism, which is the blue line right here. And the blue line actually takes that lactic acid and converts it into what? It converts it into ATP. It also takes the fat in your body and oxidizes it to form energy. So this is the preferred method, right? So we always lean towards the aerobic metabolism, okay? Because that lasts longer and it supplies more energy in the long term. So let's go to uh, panel B right here. And essentially it says, well, you know, the longer you exercise and the type of exercise that you're doing, you know, you're going to have uh, less glycogen in your body. And that makes sense, right? So if we're just walking, we could keep walking for like three hours and we're going to feel kind of tired. But if you expect me to run for three hours, I'm not going to do that, okay? I don't care. Like, I'm going to be tired, right? Because I don't have enough energy. So essentially, your body goes to your uh, sugar reserves first for energy. And once those sugar reserves uh, deplete, the body says, hey, you know, I don't have any uh, sugars to make energy with. So I'm going to have to go into uh, gluconeogenesis. And I'm going to get my fats, and I'm going to oxidize them. However, oxidizing fats takes more energy and it takes a longer time. So because your body cannot can, um, cannot produce glucose as fast, you're going to have a, uh, a shortage of glucose in your blood sugar. And that leads to uh, hypoglycemia. So now you feel tired, you don't have as much energy, you have a headache, your brain hurts, and you just don't feel motivated anymore, right? Because your brain, again, uses glucose as its main energy source. And if it can't get glucose as fast, uh, you know, if it can't get glucose as fast, it's going to feel tired. It's not going to do uh, work as efficiently. So that's why you see people kind of slowing down when they're running and they're getting tired and they just don't want to do this anymore. That's because they're experiencing hypoglycemia because they ran out of uh, sugars in their body. And panel C, it just shows that, you know, depending on the diet, uh, your recovery is going to vary. So if I eat nothing but uh, carbohydrates, well, after my exercising, I can recover in about five days, right? Actually, about two days. So in about two days, my glycogen storages are going to replenish. But if I'm eating only fats and proteins, so fish and butter, well, after I exercise, I have to rest even longer. 
So I'm going to be in my bed, you know, crying, you know, uh, regretting my decisions of exercising for about five days. So because our glycogen storages are made of carbohydrates, if we just eat nothing but fats and, and, and proteins, it's going to be harder to uh, create gluconeogenesis. Uh, to convert the proteins and fats into carbohydrates and then the glucose into glycogen, right? So it's going to take even longer to do that. So um, yeah, just uh, that's how metabolism works for carbohydrates. So again, carbohydrate uh, metabolism doesn't rely on oxygen um, and it fatigues very easily, okay? So that's why we don't really depend on it for too long, right? Because it needs oxygen to keep going. Um, so yeah, so that's the end for uh, carbohydrate metabolism. I hope that you understand why carbohydrates um, are important to your body, how gluconeogenesis uh, is the counterpart for glycolysis, what gluconeogenesis is, um, you know, why you shouldn't drink three bottles of vodka a day, right? So hopefully you understand why um, this material is here now. Hopefully uh, you do well on your exam, and I want to thank you so much for watching this video and spending your time with me today. So I hope you do well on your exam, and hope you have a great day. Thank you, and I love you. Goodbye.